service this afternoon. My name is Michael Wicklin. I'm one of the pastors here at Briarwood, and it's our privilege to serve uh, your family today and to uh, minister to you in whatever way we can and to your friends and family that are here. And this service, it's a service of celebration. Uh, one, it's a service of celebration. We worship uh, Rosita's uh, Savior Jesus and our Savior. We're trusting Christ here today. We celebrate uh, in that. But it's also a service of comfort. And we come to find comfort in Rosita's Savior. And we come to find comfort in our Savior Jesus Christ. Because we know that in our grief, we grieve as those who have hope because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ himself. And that's where we place our hope and find our comfort in time. It's like these. But it's also a challenge to us. So it's celebration, it's comfort, but it's a challenge. And it's a challenge for us to consider the question, what do we do with death? Death is not natural. Death is an enemy. And we will all one day, 100%, face the same mortality rate as Miss Rosita has. And so what do we do with death when that comes? And so that's the question for us. Where is our hope? That's the challenge for us to consider. So let me pray for us now. As the psalmist in Psalm 103 of David's psalm said, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. And Father, we come here today to worship you, Miss Rosita's Savior, to celebrate her life, to find comfort in you, Jesus, her Savior and ours, and to look to you for hope in the midst of our grief. And with the psalmist, we do bless you, O oh, my soul, and all that is within me, within us, we praise your holy name. So be with us now in this service, as we come and as we celebrate, as we find comfort, and as we remember. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, would you please stand as we'll sing, and the words are in your order of worship for amazing grace. Restore. 
restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. I invite those to come forward now to share. I always have a problem with the height. <laughs> I got that from my mom. <laughs> uh, my name is uh, Louie Heroles Harkins. I'm the third child out of nine. I guess you can call it. I'm the middle child. One of the middle child. Uh, we call my mom Inai. It's the word for mom. I am a wife. I can only describe my, my mother as an individual who is uh, an ordinary individual, and yet she's different and she's one of a kind. She's ordinary in the sense that she's one of those little girls that was born on the eastern part of the Philippines called Visayas. And her hometown is the next town to Leyte. If you go back to the U.S. history, Leyte is the town where Douglas MacArthur landed. And for that reason, she goes by two different birthdays. We never know what day or what year. It's supposed to be 1926 or 1930. We really never know. And so we're actually being, being, being haunted by this this nightmare every time because of the the legal system, you know, her her passport is 1930, but then in the hospital it was 1926. So we had to go through a, a lot of legal stuff to go, you know, but that always haunts us. However, she enjoyed that because she celebrates two birthdays. <laughs> <laughs> she would call me and say, my birthday is coming up. I said, no, I'm celebrating in September. <laughs> <laughs> so, and she is a very common person because she really had gone through a lot of uh, adversities from the child, from the, you know, from being poor. And then she became a single mother at the age of 50. And uh, I think there were um, seven of us at that time. No, eight of us at that time. So, and there's only like three older children, me, my second brother, and my elder brother. So we kind of put our resources together to get everybody through, you know, through the hoops. And fortunately, we were, we got through it. But it wasn't easy because me being here in the in the United States at that time. I have a $400 stipend every month, and I send half of that to the Philippines so that they can go on and live their life. But then again, the rest of it, my mom has to, had to farm, you know, or, or uh, well, she had a diploma in dressmaking, so she's been always making dresses. So that helped her out. But the, most of all, by 1996, after Oh, wait a minute. She came in 1989 to take care of my son, Joey. And after uh, after we found out we cannot be with, with Lola all the time because we lose some social skills. So we have to go to uh, daycare after a while. So Lola uh, was able to move to uh, Episcopal in 1996. And that's where all her freedom started. And everything has been rosy. She met a lot of new friends. Y'all are one of them. And she has been very independent. She was independent to a point that she lived 
by herself up to the last day, I think Friday last week. Even though she has options to move to my house or my sister or my brother, you know her argument is, my bathroom is only four steps away from my bed. <laughs> and my kitchen is about eight steps to the left. <laughs> so I think we all have to consider, regardless of how big your home or whether it's a multi-million dollar home, if it's not comfortable for anyone that has to live there, it's not going to be their home. So what she had, the last three months, she really had complained about pain uh, with me. Uh, since I retired in August last year, and ever since then, I told her to not bother my other family because they got their own life, they got their, you know, pressures in the job. So just call me anytime you need anything. So in her pain, I have seen them on a regular basis that she was really in pain. And I always, and she would ask me, how can you help me get out, you know, uh, we need to spend us his mother. The Lord will take you when he's ready. There's nothing I can do or the institution that I can do. Uh, we just have to pray. But the only thing in the Bible that I, I would remember about my mom, she's a very religious lady. She might not be going to church every day, but she does her novena. Uh, novena prayer, she, she does the novena every day and count in her fingers so she don't miss any of the children. Because she said if she missed one, that'd be a bad luck. For whoever she is. So. And she said her rosary too. But the only thing that I remember, and she always said, even when I was a child, she'll say, well, I leave it up to the Lord. For anything, any adversity, I'll just leave it to the Lord. I will pray and then I will work and he, he will make it happen. And that has been her biblical signature. She might not tell you what number it is or whoever said it, but in the 66 years that I've been alive, that's how she told me. And he has helped because when I, when I tell the Lord, Lord, I really don't know what you want me to do. So just give me the signal and I will leave it up to you. I surrender myself to you. And that's essentially my mom. And she has some really, uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, comedic or funny, funny, funny ways. Uh, when I walk to her house and she looked at me head to foot for more than a minute, I know she wants something. <laughs> she would tell me, I think I like the dress, it would look good on me. <laughs> she does and she meant it. <laughs> and the last thing I remember last week, she told me, well, didn't you color your hair? I said, mom, I have to color some of the roots. Well, I really need to get mine done. I said, well, you know, if a little bit better, I will. But she, she kept looking at me for the entire two hours I was in the house because she felt like my hair was so beautiful at school. <laughs> <laughs> and when I was a teenager, you know how teenagers teenager have pressure about being thin? You know what she told me? Don't just try to be thin. It's better to have a little bit of me because people will think you're not starving, you have money. <laughs> she always tell me that. She tells me it looks like I have a lot of money in the bank because I look healthy. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. She really said that. No, you didn't want to be like a skeleton that would jump out of the coffin. Exactly. That's what she said. So, well, with that, with that, oh, there was another last one. She kept a secret to everyone that she knew. Uh, would you like to just tell that later on? No, you go, ahead. you go ahead. You want, you want me to say uh, Anyway, before operation uh, last Sunday, was it Sunday? The nurse asked my sister, you know, you have to remove all your prosthesis. And uh, my sister said, well, I have to take her eye. Oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> and, uh, 
Well, you know, she's blind in one eye from an accident in the farm. But she has uh, prosthesis eyes that really, I don't, I really cannot even tell. I think it's the left one. But Laura was just like almost devastated because all these years that, that they're very good friends, she never knew that she has an artificial eye and that she never told anybody. I think I, I, think I know the reason why, because I think she want to be treated just like a normal, you know, normal person. Because she still does her cooking and she, she still does her sewing and everything. And of course, a big gardener. I mean, that's why we got flowers here for her because she just, because that was, that was her life. That's how she was able to get her family uh, through the through the uh, triumphs and challenges she has to farm, you know. I mean, we 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 have coffee, but you know you had you had to pick the coffee from the, from the three, and then and then you have all the other uh, uh, cacao, which is cocoa. I mean, we got a lot of fruits in the farm, but she has to somehow attend to that because you know we were abandoned by our father, you know. I, I can smile about it, you know, that's part of life, and you just move on. And with, with my mom, we moved on, and we just carried on, you know, we all worked. And she always say, like I said, my elder brother helped me, I was supposed to, I was supposed to help the next one to me, and then the next one, so like, pay forward. That, that's how, how, that's how it worked. And that's how I feel like everybody can remember her. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Luisa and I am the seventh child. I'm one of my daughters, me and my sister. I'm not a public speaker, but I'm going to try my best for my mom. Um, I like to remember my mom with a smile. I, I want to tell you some funny things about my mom. There's so much about my mom that makes her unique. She, as, as you all know, she's an avid gardener because she was a farmer way back home. An Episcopal place gave her a spot in the back of the building, a facility for her to garden for so many years until two years ago when her health started um, <coughs> weakening due to aging. We built her a small waste garden at my place so she could visit and play around in the garden whenever she wants. It, is, it was her therapy for the aches and pains of aging. She taught me a lot about gardening. I remember the first year that we had that raised garden, she was so excited that every time I came home from work, there was always new plants in the raised garden. The following year, I told her that she had to tell me first what she's going to plant because it was so disorganized. There were like tomatoes in the middle of the um, climbers. And her uh, purple yam, which is her favorite uh, uh, root crops, were all over the place. <laughs> Last year, I told her we would plant her purple yam outside the fence so it would not overflow from the raised garden to my grass. Well, one morning, I was walking by my raised garden. Of course, there goes the yam vine, yam vine overtaking the raised garden. She said that she did not know where it came from, but I know she did find it there. <laughs> she would have been a very successful businesswoman if she was given a chance to pursue education. She would get the harvest like the vegetables and spices from the rice garden and take it home. I thought she had been cooking and using it for herself. Little that I knew that she had been selling it to her neighbors at the facility. <laughs> In fact, one of the, uh, my friend's friend attested to it because she has a friend that lived there and her friend told a friend who was here that she was selling vegetables. Uh, she had a way of doing things that she thought would help other people. She would give me group of like five twenty dollar bills that's wrapped together in pack. This is how she did it. 
and she would give one and she gave me two thousand dollars rough like this <laughs> and and uh for she does it to help the teller the bank teller so she would not have to count but little she know she still had to count it <laughs> one by one so but carol from Alpha became my friend because of it because uh, she knew who my mom is when i bring the dollar wrap in together <laughs> um I was gonna, I was gonna mention about the prosthetic eye, but my sister already mentioned it. But Laura was just so funny when, when the nurse asked, you know, about the prosthesis, and, and I said, no, uh, she can't move her eye because it's pain. It's a prosthesis. And the nurse said, what? She keep that secret to me for sixteen years. I said, oh, you didn't know. And we kind of laugh about it. But um, mm -hmm. that's my mom. One, one thing mom cannot do is being a leader. She accepted her responsibility as a team captain for emergency evacuation on her floor. She called me one morning saying that she was at the office because she slept with a fiber and she failed, failed to wake up the residents on her floor. <laughs> so she can't be a leader. <laughs> Some of her last wo words while in the hospital that I remember, I woke up this morning and I remember this. She told me before the surgery, get my little purse with money on it. <laughs> she always, you know, respect money. I said, I got the pink one. And she said, no, the blue one, it has more money on it. <laughs> and I said, she wants to make sure all of her accounts has been accounted for. <laughs> and her first night in ICU, she, she told the male nurse, good boy with the nurse, gave her a painkiller. She looked at the surgeon holding his hands and said, she always did this and look at, look at you in the eye and he said, she said, I like you. And the surgeon said, thank you, you are so kind. Mm -hmm. Last conversation that I will never forget, she whispered to me when she woke up after surgery, she said, tapos na? Tapos na means it, it's over? I thought it was a question, and I said, yes, and you did a good job. And I told her, Matulo, can I mean, you just go to sleep, and I will, will be here by your side in the couch. She repeated me saying, Tulog na, I did not know that, 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 that the word is over is a statement and not a question. And the Tulog na is, is not, it means eternal sleep, and that's the last word I've heard from my mom. Mm -hmm. So, but I know she, she, uh, she is in peace now, and she's not in any kind of pain. Thank 
South Side of Birmingham, and we've recently begun attending Ryland's International Sunday School class. It was a diverse group of scholars and professionals studying and working at UAB from countries across the world. It was an interesting mix of retired missionaries and missions-minded individuals, and one four and a half foot tall Filipino lady. <laughs> she was adorable. The founders of this class were Bill and Savon Shore, both who have since gone home to be with their Lord in their late 80s. They loved Rosita dearly, and she loved them. In fact, they would drive from their home near the church in Cahaba Heights to a Episcopal, Episcopal place on the south side, pick her up, and drive back to the church, and take her home afterwards, backtracking all the while. They did so for many, many years. And when the drive became too much, Bill and I received a phone call from Pastor Ben Miller asking if we would mind picking up a lady that lived near us. As it happened, she lived less than one minute from our condo's doorstep. We began picking up Miss Arolas and a little boy named Sam who lived just down the road in South Towns Community Housing. Sam would later become our godson and be the ring bearer in our wedding. And I can't help but mention that he's sitting on the fourth row and earlier this month he graduated college with honors. Sam, Rosita, Will, and Laura. We were a motley little carpool crew. <laughs> Rosita didn't warm up to us right away. There were many awkwardly quiet rides those first few weeks. But what spoke loudly to us was Rosita's love for her church and the family and friends she had had there. It said a lot of her to be willing to ride to church with a couple she didn't know, and then to keep riding with us after she did know us. <laughs> she found us amusing, and we would soon come to realize she was quite spry and had a sharp sense of humor. We laughed a lot, and sometimes a little too much when we should have been. One of my favorite photos is of the two of us, head to head, tilted slightly forward and grinning from ear to ear trying not to laugh as we took a church service selfie. <laughs> it's probably during the announcements, but still we felt a little rebellious. We, I would later post it with the caption, it's a joy to worship with this sweet lady on Sundays, although she sometimes gives me the giggles. <laughs> Hashtag, pew sitting for 12 years. That was four years ago. I asked Rosita once why she had never become a member of Briarwood. With a little prodding, she eventually told me that she had not because she thought, she thought you had to pay to become a member. And she didn't have very much. Or at least we thought that, right? <laughs> I explained to her that wasn't the case at all. She just needed to attend a six-week series of classes about membership so she would fully understand what it meant to be in our church and she would give a clear presentation of the gospel. We, we attended that six weeks class the next time it was offered. I know she was so proud of her official prior name tag. She wore it almost every Sunday after that. In these last few years, Rosita was unable to attend worship regularly. The distance was too far for her to walk. She would go from Sunday school to the sanctuary. It probably took her 15 minutes to do that. And then back to the car. It's quite a large church, as you can tell. Though she was absent these last few years, I would still imagine her seated at the end of the pew with her leg extended completely straight to elevate her knee, and her foot would just touch the back of the slot that was mounted there that held the attendance register. <laughs> if she had sat in any other spot, 
it would have not have quite reached for her to rest comfortably. And I love that. I also like to remember Rosita in her garden at the Episcopal Place. She had taken a 60 by roughly 30 foot strip of dirt along the back alley to the building and transformed it into a full on vegetable producing Filipino garden. It was a crazy web of plants and strings, wooden boards and random things she had improvised with. It was amazing. She was in countless hours there and Will and I were given more long beans than we could ever eat. It was a labor of love, a job to be done, and she would go back and forth from her fifth floor apartment, avoiding the heat of the midday. Her job seemed to become a job, excuse me, her garden seemed to become a job for her children as well. She often spoke of them coming to help her there or taking her to buy seedlings to plant. I think it was her way of keeping them near to her. And as Louisa said, it was also a place where she could boss them around. <laughs> she bossed me around a few times too. <laughs> A little frustrated that I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> I was much better at taking pictures with her in the garden, and I remember quite clearly snapping a photo of her one late afternoon. She was bending over to tend to a plant, and the sun was just starting to set behind her, bathing her in a soft yellow glow. It's how I picture her now, joyfully tending the most fruitful garden she has ever grown, full of vegetables and flowers that never fade, but grow more and more lovely. Each day, free of pain, without limitation, bathed in the light of the Son of God. And Naomi's going to read a scripture for me now. Isaiah 6, verses 19 to 20. As far as the night will be your light by day, it will be bright as of the moon shine on you. For the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. The sun will never set again, and the moon will never wane no more. The Lord will be your everlasting light, and your gates will sorrow will no more. And though I miss her deeply, there's great joy in knowing she is now perfectly healed, reunited with her brothers and sisters, and waiting in heaven for those she loves. That assurance came from her own lips during one of our rare, serious conversations we had in the car about heaven. She told me simply, Jesus is the only way. It was her blessed, blessed assurance, and it is offered freely to us all. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit and washed in his blood. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I am my Savior and happily blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. Stay seated. I'm going to sing Come Thou Found. I had the privilege of playing in the international Sunday school class that's been referred to you, and we just would always love to see Rosita singing her heart out. This is one of those that we that we sang frequently. So y'all join. Me.
had uh, Nana Rosita as a member of this body, of the body of Christ universal, and also of this particular body, and what she meant to so many of the people that were here in the international community and otherwise. So what an honor to take this moment to think about her and remember her, um, and also to do what she would want us to do, which is make sure that there is a clear path that is pointed to her Savior. She didn't come here just for the community. She didn't come here just because she had some friends. This wasn't a Sunday social club for her. She was here to worship God. She was here because she believed in the one true and living God, and she believed that she had a personal relationship with him. So we don't have this memorial service and this celebration of her today, just simply so that we can have a chance to express our feelings and our emotions, although that is a very, very important part of it. We have this time as a worship service because the homecoming of a saint is an occasion for worship. So as Pastor Wickland said when we started off here just a few moments ago, uh, this is a time when we will have grief. This is, we have significant loss in our lives uh, for the three of you and for Joey and for her, for her children and those family that are here. A unbelievably and unspeakably large part of your life is now absent. It's no longer there. And when those events happen, when those significant uh, uh, areas of our life are taken away, we feel this in, in, intense sadness, this incredible grief, this sense of loss that is very difficult for us to process. And as Pastor Wickland stated just a few moments ago, one of the reasons that is difficult to process, especially for this kind of loss, is because it's not actually supposed to happen. Death is not natural. Death is not something that was designed at the beginning of this world, the beginning of this universe. It was designed to live perfectly together in balance and in harmony. And it was only the presence of sin that brought that death into this world. C.S. Lewis says, one of the reasons that we feel time passing so acutely is because we weren't made to be creatures that were bounded by time. Death is the ultimate ending of time, if you will. And so it brings an ultimate sense of loss because that is one of Satan's greatest lies. Because death is not the ultimate end of time. Death is the moment of passage to the next world. And that's going to one of two places. But we know where Nana Rosita has gone. And Paul talks about this a little. So I want to read a passage for you here that hopefully will give us some of that hope that we have. That we do not grieve as those who do not have hope, and understand why it is that we do not grieve that way. And then I want to take a couple of minutes to remember a few things that have been said already about Nana Rosita, and then I want to bring us to a little conclusion with something that I know that she would want all of you here to know as well. So if you have a copy of God's Word and you want to turn to it, and if not, you can feel free to listen. It's not a long passage. You can look in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and I'm going to read verses 13 through 18. Paul's talking to the church in Thessalonica here, and uh, this is about 30 to 40 years after the death of Christ and his resurrection and ascension. And at this point in time, people that had seen and known and been eyewitnesses to the person of Jesus they were friends with him, they were disciples, they were those who had been with him 
are now starting to pass away. And people in the church at Thessalonica are starting to get concerned, and they're saying, hey, hold on a second. He said he was coming back, but people are starting to die. Is he coming back before they die or after they die? Or what are we supposed to do? And Paul writes this to them to assure them, to give them hope. And here's what he says. He says, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others who do not have hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you. Another way it would have been to say, I prophesy, I, I truth tell to you. This we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with him, with him in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. And finally, verse 18. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. I want to just comment on two things that Paul says there. The first one is outside of the reasoning and the rationale that he gives for why we have hope. Notice that he does not say, friends, brothers, and sisters in Thessalonica, do not grieve. He doesn't say that. Paul recognizes that grief is a part of the human condition because of the world that we now live in. He doesn't look at these people and say, take your grief and shove it into a little ball and try to get through it. Pull yourself up by bootstraps. Just keep walking. Eventually your grief will fade away and you'll get over it. That's not what Paul says to the church. He doesn't tell them, do not grieve. He says, do not grieve as those who have no and to the Ariolas family in particular, what I can tell you, as someone who has heard testimony of Nana Rosita, as someone who knows the faithfulness of the commitment that she had to Christ and what she lived out with her family and her friends and her church and her community, do not grieve without hope. If you also know the Savior, you will be reunited with her once again in heaven for eternity in that garden that Laura was just telling us about. You will be reunited with her before the same common Savior and Lord and be able to spend eternity together. Do not grieve without hope. You have hope. But your hope isn't in Rosita. Your hope is in the Lord that she believed in. And that's what Paul focuses on there. And he tells us there, he says, the second thing is therefore encourage one another with these words. Encourage one another with the assurance that death is not the end. Encourage one another so that we don't dwell on the past but we remember and celebrate that past and look forward to the future, to a time when we are reunited together and reunited with our Savior. So as you go through this time, and I wanna make sure that you have that encouragement, and the reason why is because you're getting ready, you're going through a long process, and not just the process of uh, the service today, the visitation tomorrow, the uh, service that will be in the Philippines, coming back together with more family members, 
and then the long walk afterwards when all the, the services and the family gatherings are done. And it's the moment that you want to pick up the phone and make that phone call and talk to that person and hear them and see them. Continue to encourage one another with these words. That we know what God has in store for us. So in that vein, what we want to do is we want to make sure that we remember her well. We remember her well. And it, it would be... Uh, a, 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 it would be a, a bad second dish for me to go through and retell the stories that have already been told. Uh, I did not get to know Nana Rosita anywhere near as well as Will and Laura did, and certainly, obviously, no, nowhere close to what, what the family did. But I do have a, a, a remembrance, significant remembrance of Rosita here at the church. The first time that I met her, I, I moved back to Birmingham in 2009. Uh, and became more active and involved in Briarwood around 2010 and uh, got to know Will and Laura that way as well and became good friends with them through my wife Angie who had been friends with them before. And there was one Sunday that I remember. Uh, I was, we were walking out of church and uh, I see Will and Laura driving around. But then I looked and I, I took a double take and I was like, wait a second. That's not Will and Laura. That's a really tiny... <laughs> not American woman in the front seat, but that's Will. Who is that? I had no idea who that person was. And so I kind of watched, and I, I, I kind of was like, what? And then they came around the, the, the turn, and uh, and we were standing near there, and so I stopped and I waved, and Will pulls the car to a stop on the on the, on the, the circle that goes around the church. And, uh, and, and I leaned in, and Laura's head pops out from the back seat, and there's Will, and there's Rosita sitting there, and it was the first time I met her, and, and she just gave me this big smile and this big wave, and just said, and said, and said, hello, you know, and, and I was just like, hi, how are you, who are you, who, who are you, you know, I don't even know, so, and Will's got this big grin on his face and everything else, and I think Sam was in the back seat as well, and, uh, and I just laughed, and she said, she said, she said, she said her name, she said, she said, I'm Rosita, you know, and, uh, and that was the first time that I got a chance to meet her. And then from then on, for the next six or seven years, uh, got a chance whenever we would pass each other in the hallway. Uh, Will introduced her, this is Pastor Reader's son. And I think my hug, the hugs that I got from Rosita were more designed to pass on to Pastor Reader than they were because of me, more than likely. But she would always give me this great little, get it squeeze, you know, right around your, you know, head right here and everything else. They were wonderful, and it was wonderful. And she had a smile. She had a smile for everybody. She loved being at church. She loved being with her family and friends. And uh, and then I got to teach the international Sunday school class on a couple of different occasions. Once while she was there, and uh, and she was so attentive. She loved to she loved to learn and listen. And uh, as long as Laura wasn't distracting her, <laughs> she was she was just right there. No, they had a, both a desire to learn and just a wonderful sense of humor. And, and those two things just stood out immediately when you saw her. And so when, when this situation occurred, when she passed on a few days ago, and Will and Laura called and asked me if I'd be willing to do this, it was, it was certainly uh, easy to say yes. And so in the course of that, I said, look, this is my engagement interaction with him. I told them that. And he said, uh, and he said, well, we, we still would love for you to do it. Uh, you know, please feel free to come over and spend some time with the family if you'd like. And I said, I would love to spend some time with her daughters and uh, to, to learn more about her and everything else. And let me tell you, we spent over an hour and a half. I actually looked at my watch when I left yesterday. We were, we sat down while they were making this beautiful flower arrangement. And I got a chance to listen to them tell stories about their mother and about how she came to America and about their family and about all these different things. It was an incredible time. It was an incredible time. Um, just to hear more about an extraordinary, amazing woman. I, I do love, Louis, that you said that she was an ordinary woman. Uh, she was an ordinary, but a unique woman, nonetheless. Uh, and, and I'm reminded that uh, it is important for us as we recognize and remember that each one of us is an ordinary person and a unique person as well. 
My father has a saying where he says uh, that uh, character is, is revealed in extraordinary circumstances. Um, but it is built and developed in our ordinary lives. In the discipline of our ordinary lives. But I think it's safe to say that, that Rosita had an incredible depth of character that was built through discipline, uh, response, in ordinary circumstances that came through in extraordinary ways. Really came through in extraordinary ways. Extraordinary commitments to her family and extraordinary commitments to her Savior as well. I, I love, again, one of the things that, Louis, you mentioned was that she, she I, we didn't talk about this yesterday, so I'm just kind of mentioning it and working it in now. One of the things you said about the way that she approached everything was, she said, the Lord's got it. I'm going to pray about it. And now let's go work on it. Which is a wonderfully biblical approach to everything that happens to us in our lives. She demonstrated a trust and an understanding of God's sovereignty that God is in control. She recognized that our first response should always be prayer to take these things to the Lord. And then finally, God calls us to put our hands, and there's no, there, there's no coincidence that there's garden and farming imagery here, but to put our hands to the plow that's in front of us, to till the garden that God has given us. And so as I, as, I, as I thought about that and thought about the discussion and conversation we had yesterday, I just wanted to bring your attention to three things with her and then, uh, and then, and then look at one more passage of Scripture as we finish out. Uh, I think that it's come through clearly the, her work ethic and her uh, respect for the importance of, of, of money is incredibly important. She, uh, I think that the, the, fra the, the phrase that my grandmother would have used is that, well, well, son, I guess you wrung every cent out of that dollar. That's what, that's what my grandmother used to say. Uh, either you got a good deal out of something, or you made that thing last, or you didn't spend it frivolously. You, you wrung every cent out of that dollar. And that clearly comes not from, now that, that could come from two different things. It can either come from somebody who has a problem with idolizing money, or it can come from somebody that has lived without and understands its power and understands the need for it as a means to an end. And so from somebody who would actually wash her dollar bills and iron them, as Rosita did, they didn't just come folded up in those regions envelopes to go to Carolyn at the bank. They were washed, they were folded, they were ironed, they were, they were, they were, they were put together in a way that each hundred segment was understand, so you could give it to that teller. I think that uh, Louisa told me that it was if Rosita would give her the money and ask her to go to Carolyn, and she would give it to Carolyn, and she wouldn't even by the by the by the end, she wouldn't even need to tell her who it was from because it was folded and, and done in such a certain way that she knew this, oh, this is for Rosita's account, no problem. <laughs> but she didn't do that because she had a, a love for money. She worked that hard and she respected that money because she had a love for her family. She did those things that became so clear in our discussion yesterday. This idea of the family paying it forward, each person helping the other. And then after sort of, uh, the picture that I got in my head was of Rosita sort of launching the, the, the flock out the window. And then, uh, and then after they start flying and helping one another, coming along behind and, and lending her help to each one individually in different ways. And that lended itself to extraordinary commitments such that when she moved to Florida in 1989, that she did so because of uh, 
the incredible uh, success and opportunity that had been put before her daughter, um, of the opportunity to go to graduate school and to uh, work in a significant field of medical research, and then to come over and help her grandson, Joey. The love that she would have for that family, leave behind an entire life in another country to move here to live, and then do so to recognize that it was not just 10 cents she was getting out of that dollar, she was gonna get the full dollar out of that dollar because she knew that it would help her son Willie to come over then after that as well. This was a woman who had an extraordinary work ethic, an extraordinary commitment to her family. The other thing that we got to talk about was this gardening, this thing that she loved to do with gardening. She, uh, I now won't, I won't tell anymore. There was one story that was mentioned yesterday that wasn't told yet so far. They, they, she would, she would do her garden. She would tend the vegetables. She would harvest them, and then she would go around and sell them. Right? That was her. She said that was her job. She, if she had been over here 50 years earlier, and and if America, America had been amenable to it, she would have been, you know, the CEO of a company by by this point in time, at some point. But the one that I thought was really funny is that other people thought that she loved gardening so much because she loved cooking and everything, and so they would give her uh, other types of vegetables. And as was mentioned, I don't remember which one of you ladies told me this yesterday, but somebody would give her bunches of cilantro, because cilantro is a great herb and everything. And then, and then she would take that cilantro and use one for cooking, and then she'd wrap the other ones up and take them around and start selling them back at a physical <laughs> That's the best form of re-gifting there is. You're not re-gifting, you're reselling. I mean, you're gonna find whoever's eBay account that is. Check and see if any presents you've given them have ended up back on that account. This is wonderful, it's gonna fetch me a nice penny. But she loved gardening. She really did, and uh, she loved to be out there. It was, it was her livelihood when she was in the Philippines. But I do think it was more than that. I don't think it was just that she loved gardening. I also think that <clears throat> the gardening was a metaphor for her relationships. She loved to till the soil of relationships. And when you have relationships, you have to remember that those relationships are not done in such a way that they are, uh, you can't let them sit. You let a garden sit, and the garden becomes foul. Rosita worked at those. She had relationships. She loved spending time with those people. And mostly, she worked and loved spending time with her family. But even in that, even in those relationships, those loves, the third thing that came out, and we'll finish with this passage of Scripture here. The third thing that came out is that she did keep, she, she played those cards close to the chest. She did keep secrets a little bit. Playing cards close to the chest is an American idiom for when you're playing a card game and you keep them right here so nobody can see them. She did keep things close. We got two examples of it earlier. They both cracked me up yesterday while we were talking. One was the birthday secret that she would tell some people one birthday, other people another birthday, and it was not until later that we found out, that they found out when the real one was. And the second one, of course, was the prosthetic eyeball. Uh, which is just a wonderful secret to keep from anybody. The reason you couldn't tell, if you look at all these pictures of her back here and look through the thing, is she's smiling all the time. And so, you know, when you smile, you get kind of scrunched up a little bit, and you couldn't tell. I mean, I would have never known until they told us yesterday. It was hilarious. So she would keep these little secrets. She would play things close to her chest. But there is one thing, and we'll finish with this, that I do know that she would not have wanted played close to the chest. There is one secret that I knew she wouldn't keep and she wouldn't want us to keep. And that secret is what she told Laura that day when they were riding in the car and they were talking about what it means to be a Christian. And she said, Jesus is the way. Jesus is the way. So as we finish out, I want you to look at one passage of scripture with me, John 14. I want you to look, we're going to look at the first few verses here. This is Jesus, this is, this is another time. And in some ways it could have been considered another memorial service even. Because 
John chapter 13 through John chapter 17 is one of the large, it's not specifically a sermon, although there is a sermon in it. Uh, and it's one of the most intimate sermons that Jesus gave because he was giving it to his disciples in the upper room. This is the last conversation, extended conversation we have recorded of Jesus before he goes to his trial and to his death and then his resurrection. We have more conversations from after, after he was raised, but this is the last one we have from before he went to his death before us. Not only is it the last one, but it's given to his inner circle, the most beloved group. And so it's not that we would say there's more truth here than there is anywhere else in the Bible, because the Bible itself is true. But if you got a chance to listen to that last intimate conversation of somebody with their most close group of friends knowing that they were going to the cross, you'd perk up, you'd listen. What did they say? We already heard even some of what the last things that Rosita was able to tell us. And I think that there's a connection here between what she said and what Jesus says to his disciples. So in chapter 14, this is what Jesus says to his disciples. He says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you have known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. When, Louis, when, uh, when Rosita made the claim, Jesus is the way. The claim that she was making was that she had seen the Father because she had seen the Son. She had seen Jesus. She knew Jesus. And so she knew the Father. Because in Him we're adopted into His family. And so Rosita is with other members of the Ariola's family that have gone before her, that knew Christ. She's with the family of God. She's not preparing the way. Jesus prepared the way. She gets to enjoy the fruits of not seeing the Father through the Son, but now seeing the Father face to face. And she wants everyone in here to know it. If she could be here now, she would tell you, Jesus is the way. Come to the Father through him. And you will never live as one who has no hope. You will have hope. And great joy at all times, even in times of greatest grief. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for the opportunity we had to uh, be here before you today in the service of worship. As we worship you while remembering the life of our dear, dear, dear sister in Christ, mother in faith, mother to her family, grandmother, great-grandmother. But Lord, we also uh, know during this time, while there is great sadness, there is also great hope. And we pray, Lord God, that as we remember Rosita with fondness, with love, with laughter, we will also remember that she loved you. And we will know that as we face the same death that she has now passed through, that on the other side is the Father, with a path prepared by the Son, 
who offers it freely as a gift to all. We pray that all will come to know you, Lord, and join Rosita and you someday. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Ike, and to the family. Let's stand to now, and we're going to sing what Laura quoted at the end of her tribute. And I love, Louisa, what you shared about her final words, that it wasn't a question, it was a statement. That it wasn't a question, is it over? It is over, it was a statement, it is over. And that's the assurance that she has, and that's the assurance that we can have in Christ Jesus as well. We're going to sing about that now, so let's sing together, blessed assurance. <laughs> Thank you. 